So today I'm going to talk about some of this work I've been doing in Daniel Haber's laboratory. Um, and most recently I've uh, started my own lab here at the MGH Cancer Center. And I've been very focused on pancreatic cancer, and in particular using circulating tumor cells and RNA sequencing to really understand why is pancreatic cancer so difficult to treat. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what we've done with RNA sequencing and move on to some of the newer things that we're doing with single cell RNA sequencing. So first, just to, again, sort of a high level sort of uh, demonstration of what are circulating tumor cells. There are three features that a circulating tumor cell requires to metastasize. The first feature is uh, extravasation um, or intravasation into the, uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, the, um, uh, the cells are able to be detected with just this one feature. So the one thing that I wanted to say is, is that this particular feature um, is um, something that is required for all CTCs, um, but not required for metastasis. The other two features that are required for metastasis include survival in the bloodstream, so uh, being able to survive in suspension and survive the long transit uh, being, uh, being constantly attacked by white cells, and ultimately extravasation. So just because you have a circulating tumor cell in your blood that we can detect does not mean uh, uh, that you are uh, already metastatic. In fact, you need these other factors to ultimately metastasize, and therefore targeting these pathways are important for uh, patient survival. And so what I'm going to really focus on is this pancreatic mouse model. This is a, uh, the particular mouse model by Nabil Bardisi, another model by David Tuvison with uh, Tyler Jacks uh, is very similar. This is a conditional uh, activation mutation of KRAS G12D in the pancreas through the PDX1 CRE reporter and conditional uh, deletion of P53. And not only is it a genetic mimic of pancreatic cancer, but more, more importantly, it's a histological mimic of, of pancreatic cancer. And these mice develop the precursor panin lesions over six weeks of time and ultimately full-blown pancreatic adenocarcinoma at 12 to 18 weeks. And so this gives us a, a, a tremendous model to do these circulating tumor cell analyses uh, in an isogenic background. So this is the uh, second generation CTC chip. I'm going to go over this very quickly, uh, but this is the herringbone CTC chip. It works by uh, sort of a vortex flow uh, mixing uh, driven by this herringbone pattern. Uh, on this particular device, you can put antibodies, in particular EPCAM or EGFR or HER2, um, to capture your cells of interest. And in this model, uh, we used EPCAM for the mouse, and here you're seeing cytokeratin in red. CD45 staying the sort of normal white cells. And what you see is we are able to capture uh, CTCs from these mice. Uh, and they uh, not only travel alone, but they tend to travel in clusters. And we see this in about 45% of mice. It's a little disturbing to think about that you have these big clusters floating around in a patient as well. So now that we had established that we can catch these CTCs, we actually caught like hundreds to thousands of CTCs in this mouse model. Uh, this gave us a strategy to do uh, sort of uh, RNA sequencing, and so with Helico's Bioscience, I developed a single molecule sequencing strategy to uh, basically sequence things at sub-nanogram levels of RNA, given the small number of cells that we have from CTCs. And so in the mouse, we had the primary tumor, we had metastatic ascites, which is the most common form of metastasis in pancreatic cancer, and then the blood. And in this strategy, we took the blood and captured it on the anti-mouse EPCAM or CTC herringbone chip as well as a control IgG chip to control for those contaminating white cells so that we had a way to digitally subtract away the, the sort of contaminating white cells from the signature. And in this, we uh, actually identified um, a 300 uh, uh, candidates that were enriched in the CTC population compared to uh, the control IgG chip. We put this through some filters, and we said they had to be present in pancreatic tumors as well as metastatic ascites, and we wanted it to be absent in normal pancreas and blood. And we came up down to nine high candidate uh, genes that were probably involved in metastasis. We put all of these through the Oncomine database, and ultimately, WIN2 was the only one enriched in any pancreatic cancer database and was our candidate gene to sort of push forward. We ultimately validated that actually WIN2 was expressed in circulating tumor cells with an RNA in situ hybridization method uh, using branch DNA technology uh, on the Affymetrix platform. And as you can see here, we have a CTC that is cytokeratin positive, shown here in green, uh, as well as 1,2 positive. And metastatic ascites cells, so cells, again, that are sort of in suspension, very similar to CTCs, also express 1,2. 
And so long story short, uh, we, we uh, took a pancreatic cancer cell line from the mouse that was not overexpressing WIN2 endogenously, uh, overexpressed WIN2 through lentiviral uh, infection, and then ultimately showed that uh, WIN2 actually increased metastatic potential of pancreatic cancer cells. Uh, this is just the, one of the experiments that, we, that I'm showing here where we did a tail vein injection. As you can see here, the control cells do not metastasize the lungs while the WIN2 overexpressing cells do. And um, I'm not going to show this in detail here because I'm going to be showing you some of this newer stuff that we're doing. But the bottom line is that we found that WIN2's main effect in uh, the cell lines was to enhance anoikis resistance or to be able to resist apoptosis in the setting of non adherent conditions, which is a requirement of circulating tumor cells. And so it actually didn't increase intravasation, didn't increase the number of CTCs, but allowed CTCs to live long enough in circulation to ultimately metastasize. Um, and that was our major finding. Uh, ultimately, we translated to humans. These are um, uh, patients consented at the MGH Cancer Center. Um, of 11 patients with uh, positive CTCs, five of 11 of them had aberrant WINT non-canonical pathway enrichment, which was what we saw in the mouse as well. So really showing us that not only do we see this in this genetically engineered mouse model, but we can actually translate this finding to patients, and about 45 percent of our patients actually appear to have this aberrant WIN pathway. And so, uh, so for the interest of time, I'm just going to summarize uh, this, this uh, work where we showed that WIN2 was enriched in CTCs. Actually, when we stained the primary tumor, it actually only stained a subpopulation of the primary tumor cells, so about 1 to 5 percent of the primary tumor cells, suggesting that these cells are enriched in the metastatic process or potentially the, these, this is a stem cell marker. WIN2 actually confers anoikis resistance via the TAC1 kinase. We are actively looking at TAC1 kinase inhibitors as therapeutic uh, modalities for this uh, metastasis cascade. Uh, one of those uh, that we showed in this paper was 5Z7 oxozeanol, which is a natural compound that shows activity and also prevents uh, the WIN2 benefit of uh, conferring anoikis resistance, and ultimately translating this to uh, human pancreatic CTCs. So all that being said, it was uh, obviously a great glimpse of what uh, CTCs were uh, showing us and the potential that CTCs could reveal to us new metastasis sort of biology as well as biological targets to treat. Uh, there are some limitations of this prior work. And the first is that we used FCAM. This is a positive CTC marker, and so we are biased. So we cannot properly evaluate EMT because those cells are presumably low for FCAM. The second thing is that we were limited that we only saw a partial CTC signature because we did a population-based analysis of CTCs and digitally subtracted nonspecific white cells. And the last thing is we evaluate bulk CTC populations, so we can't really assess heterogeneity of CTC. So is one CTC the same as another CTC, um, and how can we address these particular limitations of this prior work? And this was the experimental strategy. Uh, we depleted leukocytes from the CTC, so we actually just got rid of all the hematopoietic cells uh, with uh, an anti-CD45 strategy using the negative uh, depletion CTC iChip. This is our third generation device, which I'll show in the next couple of slides. Mouse leukocytes are actually uh, more on the shifted to lymphocytes. They're 60 percent lymphocytes, while in humans it's about 20 to 30 percent. But all these lymphocytes are very high in CD45, so CD45 depletion uh, itself was very sufficient in sort of uh, enriching for CTCs. We applied this to the mouse again because of the high number of CTCs that we were uh, obtaining from this mouse, and this, uh, the single, singular goal was actually single cell transcriptome analysis. And so here's the uh, CTC I chip or the third generation CTC chip at the, uh, the, that was developed by Mehmet Toner's group here at MGH. Uh, the first chip is a hydrodynamic cell sorting device. This actually removes all the red cells and platelets and small constituents of blood and leaves you with a high efficiency, uh, basically, buffer code of nucleated uh, cells, including CTCs and white cells. All these, the whole blood up front was labeled with uh, immunomagnetic CD45 beads. Um, and so once you have this uh, mixture of uh, bead-covered white cells and uh, potential CTCs, it goes through this inertial focusing device, and the uh, purpose of this particular device is it relies on this uh, uh, hydrodynamic um, sort of equilibrium that allows cells to be in single file. 
So this allows us to actually magnetically sort very efficiently because you don't want a magnetically sorted bead cell colliding with a uh, non-bead cell or potential CTC, uh, which could affect your sorting. And so ultimately, you apply a magnetic field, and then you can efficiently move these white cells off to here and have your candidate CTCs here, which are unfettered without any sort of antibodies or any kind of positive selection bias. Uh, this is just uh, an SEM of the two devices. This is the hydrodynamic cell sorting array, and here in green are the nucleated cells, and you can see you start from sort of a mixture, and eventually the nucleated cells get sort of are partitioned off here while the red cells and the sort of plasma come out here. And over here, this is that inertial focusing device taking a multi uh, multiplex stream and putting them into a single file. So this is, these are the two devices that have been integrated and in ultimately creating this new chip. And so here are our CTCs from this device. This is just cytospun onto a standard uh, uh, slide. And as you can see here, we have these uh, nuclei stained in DAPI. C45 in green and cytokeratin in red. We have these nice uh, CTC here that's probably dividing. Uh, but the one thing to note was you could see that there are these beads in bright field that are marking the white cells. And this gave us a strategy to pick these non-bead covered cells as potential CTCs. And again, without any bias. And we are able to capture in this mouse model uh, 100 to 1,000 CTCs per mil of blood, which gave us a lot of uh, rich uh, CTC um, uh, material to work with. And so this is a basic strategy. We use a micromanipulator. So I looked at uh, all the cells in the dish and looked for cells that look like this or so round without any beads and avoided these bead covered white cells, micromanipulated each one of these and ejected them into uh, a lysis solution. And then I uh, subsequently put them through the single cell RNA sequencing protocol. We adapted it from the ABI 55XL platform. This is an oligo-DT primed uh, cDNA synthesis using a universal primer one, followed by poly A tailing and coming back in with another universal primer two, so that we have linear amplification in the entire single cell transcriptome. And so we did this for 168 single CTCs from five pancreatic cancer mice. That took a long time. Yeah. Um, my hands still hurt. Um, we had paired primary tumors. Uh, we also tested uh, single cells from a uh, cancer cell line derived from these mice, MB508, as well as MEFs as a non-cancer cell line control, and normal white cells from a normal mouse. And interestingly, when we put the, put the CTCs through this process, 55% of the CTCs had suboptimal RNA quality, really suggesting that they were probably cells undergoing apoptosis or necrosis, indicating that the metastatic process is not 100% efficient that about 55% of the cells that looked healthy were, in fact, uh, apoptotic. But that still left us 75 single CTCs to analyze with adequate sweet sequencing. We got about 8 million uh, RNA-seq reads per cell. Um, and so we did an analysis. And so the first thing we did was unsupervised clustering. Here are all of our single cell data. Um, and so uh, what I want you to focus on first is uh, this is uh, the MEFs, so non-cancer cell line, and a cancer cell line at single cell resolution. And what you can see is by unsupervised, unbiased clustering, we can actually show clear separation of these two cell lines. Uh, the second, so sort of uh, confirming the technical merits of our pr particular technique. The second thing is our white cells all cluster by themselves, and our primary tumors actually all cluster by themselves amongst these uh, f uh, five mice. And we have basically identified three major categories of CTCs based on this particular analysis. And so we, we've, for the first time, been able to say that uh, at single cell resolution, we can identify three different types of CTCs amongst these mice. Um, and so I'm not going to go over all the details of all this uh, for the interest of time, uh, but just to say that this first cluster here um, is uh, based on signatures uh, or platelet uh, adhered CTC. So these CTCs appear to have platelets covering them, potentially the shield, uh, potentially the platelets are responding to the CTCs and removing them. We just don't know. This other set over here, which clusters most with the uh, cancer cell line and the MEFs, are actually proliferating. So it looks like proliferation is one of these drivers that actually separates your single cell transcriptome. Um, and, and lastly, this is our classical CTCs, which I'm going to really focus on here because this is the largest group of our CTCs that we found. 
So then just another way to show the analysis is principal component analysis. And again, as you can see here, our CTCs in red, black, and blue are all sort of clustering uh, over here together, actually closer to white cells. Um, uh, and interestingly, our cancer cell line over here in green, again, sort of looks like it's more similar to a MAF than it is to its CTC or the primary tumor, really saying that cell lines are not really sort of capturing, at least in standard deuterium culture, what is actually occurring in CTCs or the primary tumor. And so if we just look at sort of standard genes that we normally do for CTCs and sort of look at epithelial genes like keratin 7, 8, 18, 19, and FCAM, and hematopoietic genes like CD45, CD41, CD61, and endothelial genes, uh, and use them just on our sort of uh, control samples, you can see our white cells are keratin low. They do have hematopoietic markers. Our primary tumors and cancer cell line are very epithelial. And MEFs, which is another cell line are, which are non-epithelial, are negative. So this, again, showing us that our data is robust and is, uh, is what we expect. And so when we apply this, you know, just looking at the same signature, uh, the same genes in, um, in our CTCs, you can see that this CTC covered platelet signature actually has very low keratin, but actually very high marks for CD41, CD61, <laughs> which are the classic platelet um, karyocyte markers. Uh, our major group here are the CTCC, or the classical CTCs, and we call them that because they are very keratin positive. So most of the CTCs that we are finding from these mice are not this uh, mesenchymal sort of heavy cell, but they're actually very keratin positive consistent with clinical data as well. And over here, we, again, we have this other set here, which I'm not going to go into deep detail, but these cells are proliferating. So let's just get into the, to the analysis of a classical keratin uh, positive CTCs. Um, so we used a non-parametric means for differential expression because of large fluxes in the transcriptome um, absolute counts. And when you do this analysis, you can show here uh, in orange tumor versus white cell and CTC versus white cell that uh, by this you see that keratin 7, 8, 18, 19 are differentially expressed in tumors and CTCs compared to white cells while CD45 is, is found in the opposite comparison, showing that this particular analysis is, is suitable for this type of data. So we then compare CTCs versus primary tumors, and again, this large purple area here is what is enriched in CTC, sort of matching the heat map you see here, uh, confirming that we are finding differentially expressed genes through this method. And so we found about 800 genes differentially expressed on both sides. These are the core pathways represented in the classical CTCs. Some of them were expected uh, in some ways, like the MAP kinase pathway, but when you start to think about this, these are all KRAS mutant cancers, and this is a comparison of the primary to the CTC. So what this really tells us is that the MAP kinase pathway, on top of being a KRAS mutant tumor, is ramped up even more in CTCs for some reason. And it's hard to know exactly what is driving this, but we do know that BRAF itself is overexpressed in CTCs relative to the uh, 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 primary tumor and MRAS, the rest that no one talks about or knows about. So maybe these are positive feedback loops that are uh, important for metastasis uh, and not in the primary tumor. Again, we see our WINT pathway, TGF beta, which is uh, obviously something that's been studied in the EMT field by Masage and Weinberg, um, and the VEGF pathway, the angiogenesis sort of pathway, uh, sort of well studied by Folkman and uh, um, and Rakesh Jain here at MGH. And the things that were unexpected were neurotrophin pathways. So why are these neurotrophins elevated in CTCs? Why is the toll-like receptor and B-cell receptor pathways elevated in CTCs? Maybe suggesting there's some interplay with CTCs in the immune response and potentially neurotrophic factors in terms of uh, mobilization. And so we did the classical thing. So we looked at epithelial and mesenchymal genes. So we took all the epithelial and mesenchymal genes in one of Bob Weinberg's recent reviews. And what we find is that all CTCs, and this is log 10 scale, so zero is one transcript per million. All CTCs have universal loss of E cadherin and universal loss of MUC1. So CTCs lose these universally except for this one cell here. While mesenchymal genes, looking at all of them, including Cadherin 2, but only Cadherin 11 and Vimentin were statistically significant. You can see it's much more heterogeneous. Again, showing that E Cadherin loss, MUC1 loss is a universal feature of these CTCs, and this M gain is more of a mixed bag or sort of a more heterogeneous sort of state. And so 
it looks like CTCs, these classical CTCs, are stuck in this mixed <laughs> biphenotypic E and M state. So we did the same with all these stem cell markers like ALDH, uh, CD44, CD24, CD133, MET. Uh, we looked at all the classical stem cell markers, but only this stem cell markers, ALDH1A2 and ALDH1A2, uh, 1A1, were significantly enriched in CTCs. These are the classical sort of uh, isoforms of the ALDH1 uh, assay aldiflor, as uh, people have previously talked in this conference. And so, so looking at these stem cell markers, we can have this uh, ability to look at RNA in situ in the primary tumors, so using the RNA in situ hybridization method. We actually find that in these primary tumors that, interestingly, when you look at ALDH here in red and cytokeratin in green, that ALDH is actually marking mostly the stroma. Um, and in a subpopulation of the primary tumor cells, there is ALDH positivity, which really suggests that, again, ALDH is very high in the CTCs relative to the tumor, but there's some kind of shared necessity of CTCs expressing something that is shared both in the stroma as well in a subpopulation of the primary tumors that seems to be important for their function. So we, we wanted to look deeper into this and say, okay, what are the marks that are really found in almost all the CTC? So I looked at, all the, at any gene that was expressed at high levels in 90% or more of the CTCs now that we have single cell resolution. And so these two, uh, these two genes, uh, IGF-BP5, KLF4, were two of those genes. Uh, another one called, called Decorin was also present in 90% of the tumors. But these two genes were co-expressed at very high levels in all the CTCs in 85% or more of them. So um, they, they, um, fundamentally this said, well, if these are co-localized in the CTCs, if we stain the primary tumor, do they co-localize in some subpopulation of the primary tumor that would tell us potentially where CTCs emanate from? And so when we did the RNA in situ, this is IGF-BP5, these are sequential slides in cytokeratin in red and KLF4 down here. We actually see that there's a lot of uh, IGF-BP5 as well as KLF4 uh, in the same regions of these primary tumors and they're at the epithelial to stromal interface. And this suggests that IGF-BP5 and KLF4 may be marking a subset of the primary tumor cells that are occurring at the epithelial stromal interface that, from which CTCs are now emanating from. And so provides us uh, additional information of where the true metastatic offenders are coming from in the primary tumor. And so in summary, um, what I've shown you uh, with this new single cell RNA sequencing data is really that we have identified three major classes of pancreatic circulating tumor cells. So not all CTCs are the same, they are very different. Uh, the classical keratin positive CTCs make up the most, most of our CTCs. We have another set that are platelet adhered CTCs and the biological function and relevance of this uh, set of CTCs versus this set of CTCs uh, will require sort of uh, in vivo cultures of CTCs and sort of more biology to, to be worked out. Nonetheless, uh, these classical CTCs are indeed heterogeneous. They do have a core gene set of pathways that are expressed like Wnt and TGF-beta and MAP kinase. They are stuck in this epithelial to mesenchymal state, so they're not fully mesenchymal. Uh, and they are enriched for this ALDH1 stem cell gene marker. Uh, CTC, uh, classical CTCs may be emanating from the epithelial stromal interface marked by the KLF4 and IGF-PP5 co-expression, uh, which is where uh, most people believe EMT begins in, in tumors. Uh, and lastly, uh, we are looking at all these 800 CTC genes that uh, we are seeing that are differentially expressed between CTCs and primaries and I've already identified about 60 targets that are therapeutically targetable uh, for uh, sort of an anti-CTC or an anti-metastasis strategy. And so obviously I'd like to thank Daniel Haver, uh, our director of the Cancer Center, as well as Shamal Maswar, who co-directed the CTC effort at the MGH Cancer Center, as well as Mehmet Toner, who uh, sort of developed all these CTC devices, and this is a true collaboration between engineering, biology, and medicine to accomplish this goal. Jay Shaw was a particular grad student um, who uh, worked on the mouse stuff with me in developing the device, and certainly a lot of the technicians as well as postdocs um, uh, were uh, instrumental in being able to execute all that single cell RNA sequencing data. Toshi Shioda runs the sequencing core, and Sridhar Ramaswamy here 
uh, provided informatic support for single cell analysis with Ben Winner as the main person uh, providing that sort of support for us. And of course, uh, I'd like to acknowledge all of my funding uh, as a young person and uh, obviously the support and mentorship of all the faculty at the MGH Cancer Center for my success. Thank you. Maybe I'll take a liberty of asking a quick question. I might have missed it, but did you compare um, individual CTCs from within the same mouse versus from a different tumor, or even in some cases, let's say they were clusters? Um, how heterogeneous would those be if you compared tumor by tumor versus right. mouse by mouse? Yeah, so it turns out that if you look, so we had five different mice, and if you actually look at each, so the main CTC cluster, this is the classical CTCs, we had representation from four different mice. So um, there were some mice that actually had all three types, there were some mice that had uh, only classical CTCs, but it really tells you that uh, these mice are able to generate any type of these CTCs. The interesting thing is if you look within the clusters, if you were a classical CTC from mouse one versus mouse two, you're, you identified most with your own mouse. So CTCs at the single cell level actually cluster by mouse within a, in, in a single cluster, really sort of identifying potentially there's like a personalized CTC per mouse that we can identify through this kind of analysis. And so I think it really speaks to not only do we have these large clusters that are shared, uh, which are targetable, but there are some personalization features that may make one type of CTC from one mouse a little different than another one. So, David, how close are you to actually capturing these cells and growing them, or you know, looking at the biology in a in a living system? So, um, we are actually culturing breast CTCs from patients right now, and we have that going. We are now trying to uh, sort of optimize those approaches for all the other cancers, but we uh, have active breast CTC cultures right now. Ultimate way of understanding the biology would be to actually capture them alive. Right, yes. And I think that what this says here is that there is a heterogeneous mix of CTCs. So you can't just go to some patient and all of a sudden, well, uh, something's going to grow. A bunch of them are probably dead, a bunch of them are maybe platelet covered, some of them are proliferating, and maybe it's these classical CTCs that are the ultimate bad guys that can grow, given they have stem cell features, this mixed in human M state sort of makes sense, but obviously a functional sort of work is required and that requires culture. So uh, the good thing is that we tested all these culturing methods and one of them is currently working and actually working in patients. So. So have you confirmed uh, that the platelet gene expression is, is due to physical plate, platelets on the cells as opposed to the cells having taken on that phenotypic change? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So um, we, we think that they're platelet covered. We've been trying to co-stain uh, for the platelet markers on the cells, but it's been a little more difficult because there's so many platelets around. Um, but when we look in Brightfield, it's just like one, it's just a single cell. Um, we do know that historically when we have stained and done electron microscopy on CTCs, that a large number of them are covered with platelets. So we think that the gene expression signatures being so altered are from platelet adherence to the CTCs. I think this has been reflected nicely by um, Richard Hines' uh, work at, at MIT showing that if you take platelets, grow them on epithelial cells, they change their transcriptional profile and turn more mesenchymal. So I think that that's actually what I think is going on in that particular cluster. It could be that CTCs themselves are you know, turning into more platelet-looking or megakaryocyte-looking uh, cells, but uh, I actually favor this platelet adherence model more. So.